Intel's new Meteor Lake chips are going to be absolutely insane. Well, it looks like we'll see the mobile chips first, this new tech will become the 15th gen desktop chips, and oh boy, there's a lot to talk about. This is a really, really major change to how Intel makes CPUs, and what Intel calls their biggest architectural shift in 40 years. Yeah, even bigger than the hybrid chips like Alder Lake and Rocket Lake. There is so much to cover here, so let's get into it. Intel's Meteor Lake architecture has a pretty big shift in straight up how the chips are made. Intel is employing the use of disaggregation of the chip design, which is the fanciest possible way I can imagine they could describe the fact that despite Intel actively mocking AMD for using, quote, glued together dies in 2017, they are now copying AMD with chiplet, sorry, tiled CPU designs. Unlike AMD, there are actually going to be four tiles in their mobile package outlines. The compute tile, aka the core die, the IO tile, the SOC tile, and a graphics tile. Let me run you through what each of those actually do. The compute tile is probably the most familiar. This contains both the P cores and the E cores. This is basically like the top half of a, an Alda Lake, a Rocket Lake chip. Uh, these are the main cores and cache. That is connected to the SOC cell system on chip cell, which is by far the most complicated die in the package, at least in terms of features to explain. The SoC cell contains the memory controller, the media engine, the new NPU, two low power island E cores, along with Wi Fi 6E and Wi Fi 7 supports, Bluetooth, display connections, Ethernet, USB 2 and 3, SATA, and audio. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot. Now, you might be wondering if the SoC cell runs all of that I.O., including both the memory controller and things like the USB and Ethernet. What does the I.O. tile do? Well, in short, PCIe and Thunderbolt 4. They actually showed how they have two different size variants for the I.O. die for differing SKUs, so I think we'll need to keep an eye on things like how many PCIe lanes the various chips actually support. I want to jump back into the SoC tell here, because this is by far the most interesting part. Now I'll get to the MPU, the neural processing units, in a second, as well as those island e cores, but what's most interesting to me here, beyond those two, is the inclusion of the media engine in the SoC tap. That's the encoder and decoder that's normally found as part of the graphics core. But now it's part of the SoC tile, which means that every single Meteor Lake chip, F SKU or not, meaning regardless of the, if the chip has that graphics tile or not, will have an H.264, H.265, an AV1 encoder and decoder built in. That's frankly huge. I suspect the reason that this has been moved here is because each of these blocks can be powered on and off independently, meaning you now don't need to wake up the GPU just to decode or encode a video or record your screen, at least assuming you aren't already using the graphics tile to display your screen. A lot of the changes that they've made here are very much efficiency focused. Before we move on to the core madness though, I want to interject just a little bit of speculation. Based on the materials that we've seen, it looks like these mobile packages will be limited to 6P cores, although perhaps the HX line in future might stretch that to the full 8 that we've already seen, but either way, I think that it's pretty conceivable that Intel will continue to follow AMD's design with multiple compute tiles. The SoC doesn't look like it has any more interfaces available for that, so perhaps we will need to wait a generation or two to see that happen, but it seems pretty obvious that Intel wants to copy AMD's chiplet design, and it makes a lot of sense to add more cores when it's just dropping an extra tile in and obviously connecting that in. It's not that simple, but it's more simple than actually designing them all in extra. Time will tell on that one though. Okay, let me get to the really big stuff here. These Meteor Lake chips will now have 
three different types of cores on board. Yeah, you heard that right. These are triple hybrid chips. We have the existing P-Cores, now with the new Redwood Cove architecture with better efficiency than the current Colden Cove cores, and the E-Cores, which are also using a new architecture, specifically Crestmont, which boasts IPC gains over Gracemont, the ones in Alder Lake and Rocket Lake. But the thing that's new here is those low-power island E-Cores built into the SOC tell. These are even less powerful and, of course, more efficient than the regular E-Cores, although interestingly, they're still built on the Crestmont architecture, but with much lower clock speeds and, quote, some other modifications. That means that the whole Intel thread director thing is even more complicated, as the new process for deciding what cores to use is this. Try to contain the task on the LPE cores alone. It sounds like every single task will be loaded into the LPE cores first, and then moved if necessary. If the work does need moving, then it will wake up the compute tile, and then move that work to the compute tile E cores, and if it still doesn't fit, as in it's a high demand task like gaming or rendering, it will then move the task again onto a free P-Core to get full performance. Intel envisages this as being a revolution in efficiency, as the LPE cores will do the majority of the work, only spinning up the compute tile uh, in the E-Cores when needed, and then only bothering the high power P-Cores if it really needs to. To me, this seems like it's going to be adding latency. Having to start the task on the LPE cores, and then move it to the compute tile E cores, and then move it again to a P core if it needs more performance, that seems like it's going to add latency. And I'm going to be very interested to see if it's going to introduce more micro stuttering while gaming, as the game engine has to wait for the task to be moved twice before actually executing. This is the sort of complexity that I was somewhat hesitant to embrace with Alder Lake. Uh, and as you can see, it, that, you know, that process, the Alder Lake process, is a lot simpler. In fact, that slide actually explains why you cannot disable all of the P-Cores on 12th and 13th gen chips. Tasks get loaded into a P-Core first, and then get downgraded to the E-Cores if they aren't a high priority. Interestingly, they would also periodically move E-Core threads back up to P-Cores to reclassify them, and then potentially move them back down to E-Cores if they are indeed not worthy of a P-Core. This new scheduling mode, though, seems more complicated, not less. Okay, let's move on to a different tile, this time the graphics tile. This is pretty exciting too. The new graphics core, XE or Z LPG, has another 2x performance per watt improvement over the 12th gen XE LP core, and it has a seemingly quite different design. It now features 8 XE cores, which are made up of 16 vector engines, basically cores themselves, meaning that it has a total of 128 cores. It's designed to run at a lower voltage, but a considerably higher clock speed. The current gen graphics peak at around 1.6 GHz. It looks like XALPG will be more like 2.4 GHz, all at a lower voltage too. The biggest change by far though is the introduction of 8 dedicated ray tracing units, one for each XE core. While Intel do technically list one of the ray tracing use cases, as gaming, the only data they provide here is ray tracing in Blender, so it's probably safe to say you won't be playing Cyberpunk on Ultra Psycho ray tracing on these chips. Now, switching gears again, I want to head back to the SOC tile and talk about that new neural processing unit, the NPU. This is all about AI, specifically running AI inferencing. When it comes to AI tech, there are two main operations. Training and inference. Training is the really computationally intensive bit. That's the thing that you need compute farms at the wazoo to do well. Really high-end hardware like a 4090 can train models, like I showed uh, with Dreambooth and Stable Diffusion, 
but that's still pretty slow and with a really small data set. Inference, on the other hand, is a lot, lot easier. That's just giving the model an input, it running it through the model or through the neural network, and then getting an output. Okay, well, but I say it's a lot easier. Compared to training, it really is. It's orders of magnitude easier, but it is still a pretty intensive task, especially for non-specialized hardware. And that is where the NPU comes in. Intel showed some results from Stable Diffusion with 20 iterations, just the CPU drew 40 watts for 43 seconds. The GPU took just 14.5 seconds at 37 watts, but the NPU, while taking longer than the GPU at 20.7 seconds, only drew 10 watts to do that, meaning it was almost 8 times more efficient than the CPU alone while leaving the CPU and GPU free to do other work at the same time. Their examples are a little corporate focused, including using teams to do audio and visual effects via the OpenVINO interface engine exclusively on the very efficient NPU, although I'm sure that more use cases will pop up as hardware support for these becomes available via these chips. To be clear, this NPU is going to be on every SKU, so no matter if it's an i3 or an i9, it will have an NPU, and that's a pretty big deal. The NPU itself is made up of two compute units, with each compute unit housing 2048 Mac units, that's matrix multiplication and convolution units. They also share some scratch pad RAM for faster data access. As for support, Intel is include, are supporting a number of APIs, including WinML, DirectML, OnyxRT, and OpenVINO. It seems like they're really focusing quite heavily on the Windows integration side of things, as DirectML is a Windows standard for machine learning. Again, we'll have to wait and see what programs end up making use of this, but it's pretty exciting to see. The final thing I want to cover here is Intel 4, the process node that Meteor Lake chips are built on. Intel quotes that the new process node is over 20% more efficient than the current Intel 7 process node that 12th, 13th, and presumably or expectedly 14th gen chips are based on. It's more dense by a decent margin in some cases, which is what aids that efficiency difference. What surprised me is that this is the first time Intel will be using EUV, extreme ultraviolet machines, to etch their wafers. For context, TSMC's N7 Plus node was the first to move to using ASML's EUV machines, starting in late 2019. What's even funnier to me is that Intel was one of the major shareholders in ASML, but chose to hold off on implementing EUV until it was more stable, which allowed TSMC and their customers, namely AMD, to take advantage of Intel's delay and roll out some impressively efficient and performant chips before Intel. To be clear though, only the compute tile uses Intel 4 as its process node. Much like AMD does with their Ryzen chiplets, Intel is mixing and matching different process nodes in these Meteor Lake chips. Both the I.O. and SOC tiles are using TSMC's N6 process node, and the GPU is built on TSMC N5, and the base silicon tile that they you know, bond all of their uh, packages to as part of their Foveros packaging is Intel 16. I'm planning on making a video explaining more about why both in AMD and now Intel are moving to these chiplet style dies, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. Something else that's interesting is this roadmap. Intel 4 is ramping up production now, but they plan on moving to Intel 3 pretty soon, and then 20A about half a year later, and then 18A half a year after that. Considering Intel's history of sticking with a process node until they absolutely have to move on, this seems like a major shift in how they operate. Likely thanks to them taking delivery of these more reliable EEV machines, there are a lot of process node improvements that they can do with that new tech. So to recap, Meteor Lake is a tiled chiplet style design featuring an SoC tile, compute tile, IO tile, and graphics tile. 
The SOC Tel now hosts two low power island E cores, which take all tasks in first and then delegate out to the compute tel if needed. And it contains a neural processing unit for AI inferencing. Plus, they've moved the media engine out of the graphics tel and into the SOC tel, so every chip will have media encode and decode built in. The P and E cores are new designs, as is the graphics core, and they finally moved to Intel 4, the first EUV-based process node from Intel. That's quite a lot new, huh? Of course, we will have to wait and see what products actually become available and things like performance and what features and support and you know what new bugs there may be with this new sort of uh, hybrid or triple hybrid setup, but hopefully we'll find some of that out at least somewhat soon. Of course, uh, you've heard the uh, the news, but I would love to hear your thoughts on it in the comments down below. What do you think about Meteor Lake, the triple hybrid setup, the NPU, the new SOC tile and the whole tile design, Intel 4, all that sort of stuff. Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. Otherwise, if you want to see more videos like this one, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. You can also check out plenty of other videos on the end cards when they pop up in a second. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so through YouTube, Patreon, pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, or a load of other designs I made myself, pick up an open source response time or latency testing tool at osrtt.com. Or that's kind of it, really. And there's a load of links in the description if you're interested. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all in the next video.